the 1840s, a railroad was built across what was then the industrial outskirts of Philadelphia. It was massive, five tracks across. So when the industry moved out in the 1950s, it left a 78-foot gap across South Philly. And in its place, the city built that. This is Washington Avenue. Five lanes across this 2.4-mile stretch is one of the most dangerous streets in Philly, seeing a reportable crash every 8.6 days. Starting in 2011, neighborhood road safety advocates have spent the last decade pushing to have this street restriped. And in 2020, the city released its final design decision, a road diet that for most blocks would slim this monster down to three car lanes, with parking-protected bike lanes, shorter crosswalks, and Dutch-style floating bus stops. Construction was slated to begin in 2021. But it didn't begin. It ran into opposition. And after 19 months of negotiations, what was meant to be a routine repaving has now attracted national media attention. So this month, I want to find out what it takes to fix a dangerous urban arterial in a city where the streets are centuries old and their future is still up for debate. I'm gonna play this song, but sing the lyrics wrong and say that it's a parody. In the 1980s, PennDOT was trying to figure out how to address the disturbingly high crash rates on a state route in Derry Township called Electric Avenue. See? It was related. The fundamental problem with Electric Avenue was that it was a strode, or street road, essentially a highway with driveways, a deadly combination. Desperate for a solution, PennDOT decided to do something which, at the time, was radical. They would restripe Electric Avenue from four lanes to three with a center turn lane. When polled, locals opposed the project 19 to 1, but PennDOT made the call to do it anyway using federal highway funds. Thankfully, it was an enormous success, and Electric Avenue is in the same configuration today. Now, PennDOT did just use the extra width for shoulders, and this thing is not exactly peak urbanism, but crashes dropped to essentially zero. What really sealed the deal was that travel times did not increase. Before the restriping, Electric Avenue had 13,080T, which is nerd speak for average daily traffic. Over the following decades, North American traffic engineers have cautiously tested to see if road diets can work with higher traffic volumes. Today, the Federal Highway Administration considers roads up to 20,080T good targets for road dieting, and if anything, they have a vested interest to quote a low number. Road diets have been done without reducing travel times on roads up to 24,080T. So what is the ADT of Washington Avenue? Well, as you can see, it's jumped around over the last decade. At this point, we have definitive measurements that it's under 19,000. But it was a bit less clear back in 2011 when the mayor's Office of Transportation and Utilities first started studying a road diet west of 4th Street. After they decided it would work, they started the outreach cycle. They were thorough, running multiple rounds of local surveys and holding meetings in all 19 registered community organizations along the corridor, of which 17 were in support of the road diet. The trouble began with the dissenting Queen Village neighbors and Pennsport Civic Associations brought on a real-life traffic engineer to critique the initial traffic study. One of the critiques was that the study used that 10k traffic count where it dipped in 2011. And honestly, that is a pretty good point. But the city didn't simply correct the study and continue with the project. Thanks to this vocal minority, the plan got stalled until 2020 when the city decided it had procrastinated repaving long enough. The last repaving happened in 2003, when I was one, so influencing this repaving probably means changing Washington Avenue for the next 19 years. The street is included in what Otis, Philly's Office of Transportation, Infrastructure, and Sustainability refers to as Philly's high injury network, the 12% of streets responsible for 80% of the crashes. Of those crashes, the share on Washington Avenue involving pedestrians and cyclists is 2.6 times that of Philly as a whole. So to flesh out a new redesign, Otis restarted the community input process in March 2020. Not ideal timing, but they really tried their best. They held online meetings and created a guide and video series explaining the restriping proposals. Then, they mailed out postcards to everyone within 500 feet of Washington Avenue, got eight RCOs to tell their members, blasted on social media and media media, and put up posters along the street. The input phase ran from March to July, receiving feedback through the website, text, voicemail, email, and mail mail, and the online survey got 5,458 votes. The whole thing was done in English, Spanish, Chinese, and Vietnamese, and if you're wondering, the majority of respondents were actually from South Philly. Here's what they had to say. The online survey presented three options. Option A was the most ambitious, with near full conversion to three lanes, but keeping it five lanes near Broad Street where traffic is the greatest. 
Option B was an asymmetrical four-lane arrangement with two travel lanes toward Broad Street. And option C was this weird mashup of the first two. In the survey, option A stomped the competition. Traffic flow was rated as the lowest priority, and as you can see here, the desire for some sort of change was near unanimous. At this point, the city had secured federal funding and finished the last of the traffic studies, confirming that traffic was under 19,000, and at peak hour, cars would not be delayed more than 10 seconds per block. So in September 2020, Otis released their final design decision, option A, the road diet had won. But as the 2021 construction season drew near, the timeline began dragging farther and farther behind schedule, and it became clear that something was holding up the plan. On June 24th, the community group Point Breeze CDC, which was opposed to the restriping, met with City Council Member Kenyatta Johnson from District 2, which covers the western two-thirds of the project. In attendance was a representative from Otis. The opposition first objected to the survey not including a no-change option, which is what they would have preferred, and to the fact that it didn't ask for demographic data. If you've ever taken a community survey before, you may have filled out a section asking your age, income, race, or maybe even gender. It might seem a little weird, but it's so that the city can weight the results to the neighborhood's demographics and hopefully get a better idea of real public opinion. Otis did not do this, and they probably should have, but there's a deeper reason why this was such a sticking point. Over the years, the neighborhood has been growing steadily whiter and younger. So some road diet opponents have started arguing that redesigning Washington Avenue will cause younger, wealthier people to move in which will then raise local prices. Being priced out of the neighborhood you grew up in is a chilling prospect, and in Philly, it's happened many times before. But I think keeping Washington Avenue dangerous and unpleasant is not a great approach to housing affordability. And where displacement is an issue, I think the truly just thing to do is to implement real affordable housing policies that have been proven to actually work, instead of denying the people of South Philly the transportation improvement they deserve. One of the most persistent myths surrounding road diets is that they slow down traffic by intentionally causing congestion. While congestion is pretty effective at this during rush hour, it fails at all other times of day, when multi-lane streets convert into wide open legal speedways. The traffic calming power of road diets actually comes from two other effects that come into play when redundant lanes are removed. First is the convoy effect. When there's an inner travel lane, speed demons will use it to get around the slow pokes, which is actually somewhat safe on a simple highway but in a complex environment, it's a recipe for disaster. The second effect is purely psychological, but still powerful. When people see cars to one side traveling the same direction, they stop focusing on their stationary surroundings and start focusing on racing the other lane. And sure, they should stop driving recklessly, but the reason they're being reckless is because the built environment is telling them to drive like it's a highway when it's actually a city street. The science is clear that road diets save lives, a decade-long study of seven road diets around Flint, Michigan, found dramatic decreases in all categories of crashes, with an average reduction of 32%. And the Federal Highway Administration's 2010 study of 45 sites found a 29% reduction. And if you think I'm cherry-picking, there's a link to a bigger list in the description. After a series of additional meetings with Point Breeze CDC and Councilmember Johnson, Otis decided to explore scrapping the final design decision and start a monthly working group with people for and against the restriping, hoping they would talk to each other and work out their differences. The opposition group started by saying that back in 2020, they didn't know about the plan because nobody had told them. Even Councilmember Johnson said that he didn't know about it, which doesn't really explain this tweet, but maybe his assistant tweeted it? He's maintained that he doesn't oppose the three-lane plan per se, but he just doesn't support it and won't vote for it. The council member representing the eastern section is named Mark Squilla, and he's maintained a solidly neutral stance, saying he trusts Otis's decision-making process. But wait, does city council even need to approve the plan? Well, normally a road diet would require council approval, because in 2018, the city passed a law saying that any new bike lane needed city hall sign-off, essentially halting expansion of the city's bike lane network. But on Washington Avenue, there already are bike lanes. You just wouldn't know it, because in 2015, the city forgot to repaint them. But technically, they do exist. So Otis could just do this unilaterally, right? No, because there's still something they need from council. Currently, Washington Avenue operates on a forever parking policy with no time limit, making open spots so hard to come by that people often park in the outer travel lane or the median. This is bad enough with five lanes, but if we're going down to three, this has to change. Only city council can change the policy. And because of councilmanic prerogative, the decision is up to Johnson. 
The three-lane side of the working group included the Point Breeze Business Association and the community groups Sosna, Bella Vista Neighbors, Passyunk Square Civic, East Passyunk Crossing, and Dickinson Square, along with the Bike Coalition and Fit Square, a Philly urbanist group, which, full disclosure, I'm a member of. Another party that joined the Road Diet side was parents, students, and teachers from the local schools. As you can see, the catchments for the K-8 through schools Stanton and Jackson are split by Washington Avenue, requiring kids to cross every day in the morning rush hour. The principals of Stanton, Jackson, Palumbo, Independence Charter, Chester Arthur, and Nevinger Elementary have all officially sent letters to Squilla and Johnson urging them to support the three-lane plan. The first few working group meetings were mostly just yelling, but at this point the opposition's arguments had fallen into three main categories. Many of these objections are silly, like cyclists running people over, but there is a legitimate concern surrounding emergency vehicles. I might not care if drivers get stuck in traffic, but what about an ambulance or a fire truck? Well, we need to remember that there are three-lane streets in Philly that emergency vehicles use regularly, such as 52nd Street in West Philly. They get signal priority, and if traffic's really bad, they can just go down the median. That is, unless it's blocked by parked cars because of the lax parking enforcement. Some heavy-duty auto-dependent businesses, like the one behind me, have voiced concerns about vehicle access, specifically for trucks. Since time delays will be minimal, I would argue that the situation for trucks would actually be improved, since making left turns will be easier. As for cars, the only thing that might deter customers is not being able to find a parking space, which is how it is currently, and as I've discussed, Kenyatta Johnson could fix it if he wanted, but instead he's choosing to use parking as a bargaining chip against Otis. Research on this subject is inconclusive, and we can't see with absolute certainty that traffic on side streets like this one will stay the same. But I argue that it doesn't matter. Think about it like this. The idea that if we don't let cars force out all their street uses over there, they'll invade over here, is mafia-esque. That's a nice side street you got there. Be a shame if something were to happen to it. <coughs> if traffic really does increase, then we should put speed tables, pinch points, chicanes, or maybe a couple turn only medians to protect the side streets. The solution is traffic calming, not surrendering to the car's insatiable appetite for capacity. Anyway, back to the working group. Fanny Washington Avenue. This is what it's going to look like when you reduce it to three lanes from five lanes. People were angry, they were blowing their horns. Tensions escalated around late October when the opposition held two protests. In the second one, they marched down the avenue blocking traffic to show that four lanes were not enough. They actually caused a small car crash, which they cited in a meeting as evidence that the road diet would be less safe. Both sides also began launching petitions. By November, the working group had found a compromise. Sort of. They would do a third survey, but this time it would be entirely on paper. The survey also had to be hand-delivered and administered by working group members. And the questions were weird. The first thing is that it's extremely vague. What three words come to mind when you hear change being made on Washington Avenue? Should Washington Avenue be changed? Yes or no? Why or why not? It asks these without a single sentence explaining what the proposed changes actually are. And you know what else isn't on there? The demographic questions! The survey ran for a couple months, and at the December meeting here at Wharton Square, both sides dumped out a total of 790 surveys on the table. For should Washington Avenue be changed, 750 answered yes. That is 19 to 1. And here are the word clouds for the written answers. The meeting got even more heated than usual, and some on the opposition side said the survey was illegitimate. This frustrated even Mike Carroll, the director of Otis, who had patiently attended every working group meeting from the beginning. At the end of the meeting, he said that Otis would take the feedback, come up with a new plan, and present it at the final meeting on February 5th. On February 5th, at the Christian Street YMCA, Otis announced it had eliminated the three-lane plan from consideration, leaving the mixed and four-lane options to battle it out behind closed doors until March 1st when they would announce the winner. Option A, the final design decision, was officially dead. Feet First Philly and the Bike Coalition condemned Otis's decision, and on February 7th, FitSquare launched the Safer Washington Avenue Fund, which raised $10,000 in under four days. Campaign funds explicitly earmarked to support pro-traffic safety candidates, potentially including challengers to Johnson and Squilla in the 2023 primaries. Can I get a good close to, uh, refocus their attention up here so we can get going? So, 
folks who haven't heard already or haven't seen, we're moving forward with what we call the mixed lane option. So this was one of the original options that we were looking at before. It incorporates uh, both four lane and three lane sections. Okay, so we're going to keep coming back to Washington Avenue. It's not news to us that not everybody's happy with this plan. I think that's been pretty well established by a lot of people. We feel like under the circumstances, given the fact that for 10 years we've been talking about Washington Avenue, it's time to move on to the next chapter. And so as we're, as we're moving on, we're going to address the safety issues as best we can, balance the issues that we have with congestion and issues. But that doesn't mean that we're done. You don't so like what I've said in the past, you do not we have an opportunity as neighbors to come together with the city, with the businesses, and then we can talk, we can talk about what Washington Avenue should be moving forward. And so when we talk about what Washington Avenue should be moving forward, It's not all bad. Otis is now tentatively committed to putting traffic calming on side streets, and for many sections, the bike lane will still be moved behind the parking. But judging by the two surveys, support from the majority of RCOs, and the letters from six school principals, most people in South Philly wanted something better. And the fact that it took a decade of fighting to win a plan this mundane is deeply disturbing. It also doesn't bode well for Philly's commitment to reduce traffic deaths to zero by 2030, which have so far stayed the same. Otis has said the reason they changed the decision was squarely a matter of equity. But I don't think it's equity to prioritize vehicle traffic over the safety of pedestrians and cyclists in a neighborhood where a third of households don't own cars. And for renters, that rate is nearly half. Right now, Washington Avenue has 8.2 acres of large surface parking and empty lots. This prime real estate puts the city in a great position to extract affordable housing commitments from developers, a rent lowering solution that would actually work without the neighborhood suffering to make it happen. I believe the best way to make good urban planning decisions is democracy, and I think Otis's leadership does too. But on Washington Avenue, the community didn't choose the mixed option. The city did, when they raised the threshold for three lanes to nothing short of consensus. When the road crew shows up this summer, I want Philadelphia's leaders to remember two-year-old Derek Martinez, who was killed in this crosswalk by a Mercedes-Benz or the family who was run over right where I'm standing by an out-of-control car in 2012, killing 11-year-old Samantha Noyan Ortenez. I want them to think really hard about 29-year-old Sheena White, who was killed by the 32 bus right there in front of her eight-year-old son, or 83-year-old Sarah Wood, who died in this crosswalk after she was run over twice. With the repaving, the city had a chance at redemption, a chance to make sure those who died didn't die in vain. But instead of seizing the opportunity, they settled for a street that compromises on safety probably for another 19 years. If the city's leaders are satisfied with that, then maybe next year, Philly should get some new ones.